Welcome to The Epic Life with Pastor Bob Hallman. We invite you to listen to this timeless and inspirational message from God's Word. May the Holy Spirit encourage and strengthen your heart today. Okay, let's turn to the book of Exodus. We're continuing our study there. And as you're kind of flipping over in your Bible to that passage, um, let me give you just a, a little background. The people of Israel are in Egypt. They've been in bondage for 430 years. In the midst of this, their population was exploding. The Egyptians became intimidated by the, by the explosive growth of this population of slaves and decided that the only way to stem the population was to exterminate all the male babies. And so in that time frame, when Pharaoh made this edict, Moses was born. Through a divine intervention of God, his life was spared. He became the son of Pharaoh's daughter and lived for 40 years a very uh, exemplary life in the sense that he was in the palace. He had the best education, uh, the best food, the best house, everything the best. And he was being groomed for leadership in Egypt. But one day he went out and he saw his fellow uh, Israelites being beaten. And he thought to himself, for such a time as this, Unfortunately, it wasn't God's timing. And he took things into his own hands and he got ahead of God and he took the life of one Egyptian and his life essentially came to a screeching halt and was forever transitioned. And he spent the next 40 years tending sheep in the desert of Midian, which isn't too far from Sinai. We find that he actually got married to a woman named Zipporah, had two sons, and um, had actually had an experience and an encounter with God at, at the foot of Mount Sinai. And he saw this, uh, this amazing event with this bush that was burning but wouldn't be consumed. We talked about that last week, how that really represents uh, the twisted, tangled, uh, thorny parts of our life that it's a foreshadowing of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory of God, foreshadowed in the book of Exodus in the burning bush that God would take up residence uh, for that time in that the lowest of all plants. I don't know if you can get much lower than a tumbleweed and that's what God revealed himself in. Not a pillar of fire, or a pillar of cloud, or in some glorious, majestic, booming voice, but he revealed himself in a twisted, thorny, useless bush. Foreshadowing, really, the amazing gift of the indwelling spirit in the life of a believer today. And in the midst of that conversation the whole, that God had with Moses, he instructed him that he was going to be a deliverer and he would be the one that would be sent back. Then we had uh, a fairly consistent rejection by Moses of that calling. And that's why I've entitled the message this morning, Beating Around the Bush. And so I'd like to begin by reading the text, and then we'll consider its application to our lives today. Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Moses answered, What if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was leprous like snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, oh Lord, you know I have never been an eloquent speaker, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, oh Lord, please someone, send someone else to do it. 
Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform miraculous signs with it. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me go back to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go, so he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son." At a lodging place along the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the desert to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the miraculous signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they had heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity that we have this morning to bow our hearts in worship before you. God, you have made so many wonderful and precious promises, and God, you are a God that delivers. You're a God that saves. And like Moses, who was a foreshadowing of Christ, you have sent your deliverer to us. And God, you have performed miracles. And God, you have made known your desire to set the captives free. You've seen our misery. You've seen our suffering. And you made a way through Christ that we might have life eternal. God, I pray that as we go through this passage this morning, that you might teach us and give us joy. We might really enjoy ourselves, but also be instructed. And that our hearts answer before we even know what this text says would be yes. Yes to you. Yes to your spirit. Yes to your purpose. Yes to your will. Yes to your pleasure. And so, Father, move us by your spirit. Holy Spirit, take my simple words and preparation in my mouth and my heart and my mind and use them to build up and encourage your saints for your glory and your praise. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Beating around the bush. It's a phrase that we kind of know uh, what it means. Uh, Not many of us know the origin. The truth is, is no one really knows the origin. I did a, a search on internet trying to find the origin of beating around the bush no one really knows. Personally, I think it came from this text. You know, there are a lot of uh, of phrases that we have in the English language that are all traced back to the Bible. I think this is one of them. But someone has suggested that possibly beating around the bush is a hunting term, and a a hunter would go out, and rather than go in uh, to the the, uh, environment of a wild animal, they would beat around the bush and try to drive the animal out rather than go in and risk life and limb. But today, the definition basically means to delay or procrastinate, to avoid, to excuse uh, doing what's needed or necessary. Nonetheless, very similar to Moses' attempt to get out of the calling of God in his life, he's already told us and uh, told God in the text of chapter three that he doesn't think he's qualified to do it. The second thing is he doesn't know God well enough to do it. And now he comes up with another excuse in verse one, what if they don't believe me? Now, it's interesting because God had already told him in chapter 3, verse 18, that the people would believe him. God prophesied and gave Moses encouragement and said, Moses, don't worry. I know what you're anxious about, but I'm going to tell you right now, Moses, they will believe you. They will respond. They will hear. 
and they will rejoice at the words that I'm giving you. But Moses then follows up with a lack of faith and says, what if they don't believe me? But Moses' question shouldn't, shouldn't have been, will they believe me, but do I believe God? And this was the problem that Moses was having. He was having a, a, a lack of faith. He had a, a bout of unbelief that was keeping him from doing God's will. I was thinking about the application to our lives and, and how the Bible is actually filled with promises. You know, The Bible, from beginning to end, there are hundreds and hundreds of promises that are for the believer that give us hope and encouragement. Let me share a couple of them with you. For instance, God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now, if we really believe that, that God is going to meet all of our needs, then you never have to worry about a financial situation again in your life. But I guess many of us probably had some anxiety about our finances maybe this week or this last month. Why do we worry? Because we are doubting God. We're having a bout of unbelief. How about God will never leave you or forsake you? Anyone ever feel lonely or isolated or like no one understands and you're the only one? All those kind of self-pity feelings. We all have those at times. But the promises of God's word clearly counter that. If we don't believe it or grasp it or live by it, we're basically saying to God, I can't accept the validity of your promise. How about another one? We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Have you ever felt like you can't go on? You can't continue in this marriage? Your kids are so bad that you just want to strangle them? That you can't go to work again? That you want to just bail? That you want to just run away? Well, the Bible says that God in all things can give us strength if we put our confidence in him. The Bible also says if we ask according to God's will, we can ask for whatever we wish and it will be given to us. I mean, is that a crazy promise? If we ask according to God's will, we can ask for anything and God will give it to us. Well, you have to keep in mind it's according to his will. But you know what? You know why I want to suggest to you that we don't necessarily believe that? Because if we believe that, we would not want to stop praying. We would want to pray constantly. Why? Because we can affect history. We can affect people's lives. We can affect our future. We can affect our emotions. We can affect all kinds of things in our sphere of influence and even beyond through prayer. But because we don't really completely hold to it, we have kind of a bout of unbelief, we don't pray that much, even though God invites us and says, if you pray according to my will, I'm going to bless you because I want to use you and I want you to participate in my glory. How about Jesus is preparing a place for you? I love that one. If we really believe that, it would affect our lives. We'd be less concerned about where we live. We'd be less concerned about our 401ks and the the terrible market drop and 40, 50% that people have lost. A lot of people have lost more. I I have a couple of small stocks, and uh, one of them was in in Lucent, and it went from $1,000 that I squirreled away for a long time to put in there, and it's now worth $46. Yay! I've got something. That's a pretty nasty drop. But when you know that God is preparing a place for you, it's like, who cares? Who cares? This isn't our home. We're aliens and strangers. We've got a promised kingdom that's coming, and it's going to surpass anything here by far. And it's something so glorious and something so special and so eternal that we can look forward to it and put up with all the things that are happening here and knowing it's temporary. And it fills our hearts with joy. It should anyway. But if we have a bout of unbelief, we'll go around worrying about everything and forgetting these wonderful, gracious promises of God. And so we find that Moses, very beginning of chapter four, is having a bout of unbelief. God graciously answers with miraculous signs. And he tells Moses, what's that in your hand? And he says, it's a staff. You know, a staff or a rod is a very common instrument for a shepherd. It's nothing fancy. I know what they look like because my son has about 25 of them in my office. Anywhere he goes, he's got a, he brings home a staff, a big, it's almost always guava. He's an expert on staff uh, fashioning now. It used to be anything, Howbush, but, you know, he's, he's really specialized. If anybody needs a staff, by the way, uh, check with my son. He'll, he's got a deal on them for you. Uh, so he's got these staffs, and they're all lined up. In my, they're in my office, all leaning against the wall, and I was looking at them as I was preparing this message, and he's got a couple that have some designs carved into the top, and he's got a couple that have wrapped twine for holding them, but you know, the truth is they're very plain. All of them are plain. A staff is plain. It's functional, but it's plain. There's nothing very fancy about it. There's nothing very attractive about 
the average staff, there are staffs that you can buy in a specialty store that are gold and everything, but those aren't, those aren't really for being used. Those are for being looked at. The staff that Moses had for years was functional, and he used it. And God says, what is that in your hand? And he says, it's my staff. Little did uh, Moses know that shortly that staff would be used to part the Red Sea. That staff would strike a rock and enough water would gush out of that rock to quench the thirst of millions. That staff would be held over his hand in the battle with the Amorites and with the Midianites. And that staff held over Moses' hands, that simple staff, would be the difference between victory and defeat. God tells him to throw it on the ground. And so Moses is like, well, it's fallen plenty of times on the ground before. So he throws it on the ground, having no concept or clue where God was going with this. And it immediately turned into a, a venomous, poisonous serpent. You see what the text says. He ran from it. Moses is an experienced uh, shepherd. He knows what's dangerous. And he ran from it. And God called him back and said, don't run from it. Come back and pick it up by the tail. Any of you watched any of the Discovery Channel? Anything about snakes? Does anybody know anything about snakes here? There's some of you that know about it. You never, never, never pick a snake up by the tail. Maybe Steve Irwin can, but the rest of us, you don't do that. Why? Because if you pick it up by the tail, it's going to use that stationary power of your grip on its tail to whip itself around and to sink its venomous fangs into your flesh. <laughs> it's going to sink something into you, and it's going to hurt and be bad. And so Moses realizes that, but in obedience, you got to give this guy credit. I want to tell you from the get-go, Moses is just like, a, he's just like us. We are a combination of great faith and total unbelief. One minute, he's an unbelief, and the next minute, God says, pick it up by this tail, and you're, okay, if you're telling me to, I will. And he picks it up, and of course, it became a staff again. We know that the leprous hand thing was, was amazing. By the way, leprosy was incurable. It was incurable all the way up and even till Jesus' day, and, and even beyond that. And so when one of the prophecies about Christ is that he would heal leprosy, and that's why Jesus was healing lepers, because it was a sign. It was a miraculous sign identifying Jesus as the promised Messiah. But we find Moses is told by God in this burning bush to stick his hand in his cloak, and so he does, and he pulls it out, and it's leprous. Can you imagine? It's like having somebody, you, you know, go from being totally healthy and then suddenly saying, you have stage five cancer and that you've got a death sentence. So Moses pulls out his hand. He's like, oh, I've got leprosy. It's white as snow. And God says, stick it back in your cloak. And he sticks it back in. And he pulls it out, and it's just like new. Amazing. And so God gives him these two signs. And he says, if they won't listen to those signs, I'm going to give you a third sign. And it's a sign that Moses wouldn't be able to perform until he actually got to Egypt. But when he got there, if they rejected these signs, which they did, God instructed him, to, pour, to get water from the Nile and pour it on the ground and it would become blood. And in essence, the first two signs were to cause the people's heart, including Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to turn to God. But if they would not, and Pharaoh would not, in the future we'll find that as we go through the text, then this final sign was not a sign of redemption. It wasn't a sign of transformation. It wasn't a sign of healing. It wasn't a sign of, of any kind of hope. It was a sign of judgment because this is the one sign that is not removed. It's not the sign that's turned back to its original state. And so Moses is given these signs. I want to just take a minute to give an application to our lives regarded, regarding this staff because I think it's an important aspect of what we can take away from this message today is that what was in Moses' hand was a very simple instrument that he used just as a normal part of his life. Uh, he didn't get up in the morning and say, oh, my staff. Everybody, look at my staff. You know, he didn't go around and have, you know, parties showing their staffs off. You know, sometimes you go to Kaylee or wherever the guys pull, you know, open the, the hood of their car and they just, for hours, they'll stare there with their buddies at the engine, you know, and it's just like, you know, just looking at the engine. But, you know, Moses wasn't doing that kind of a thing. He didn't get out with his other buddies and just put their staff up on the rock and just, you know, look at the staff for hours, you know, and talk about the staff and its value. And, you know, a staff was very functional. That's all it was. It got the job done. And it was something that Moses was familiar with, and it was common. I, I, want, I share these things with you because how God works in our lives is that you've got some simple things in your life already that are in your control. They're in your hand. It's a, a talent. It's an ability. It's something that probably, more than likely, you use as a regular part of your life in your vocation. 
It's a, it's a gifting in art. It's a gifting in speaking. It's a gifting in writing. It's a gifting in math or science or, or some physical aspect of what you can build or create or design or whatever it might be. But God has gifted every one of you. And you think to yourself, it's just a staff. And what I want to share with you is that God in his glory and his, his kindness to us and his faithfulness and his mercy says, throw it down and let me show you what I can do with your talent. Part of the problem for me, and I think most of us are like this, is that we look at the things that we do and we think, can't everyone do this? Isn't this common to be able to do this? I don't think it's anything special. And then you talk to somebody else and they're like, what are you talking about? You know, I can't even come close to that. You're gifted in this area. And so often we, for, we forget the, the gift that God has given us and we downplay it and discount it. And then we wait for God to do something great with our life but we won't throw the thing down that he's already given us to do. And I want to encourage you, there are all of us here today, but there's probably some in particular that you're wondering what you're supposed to be doing with your life and how you can use God's gift for your glory. And what I want to tell you is it's already in your hand. Throw it down. Give it up. Stop taking ownership of it. Stop laying claim to it and throw it down and let God raise it up and use it for miraculous signs for his glory. Again, parting the Red Sea, making water gush from a rock, gaining victory over enemies. Who would have ever thought something so simple as a staff could accomplish su such things? But in the hand of God, when it's removed from our, from our grasp, can do great things. I want to share a couple of illustrations of this from the word. In, uh, in Judges chapter 3, Shamgar, who was one of the judges... Uh, in battle, picked up an ox goad. I mean, that's just a stick with a, a curve on the end of it. That's all it is. And he, and he just wiped out an army with it. I think about David. You know, King David, young David? What did he pick up to kill this massive giant? Five stones, and he only used one. He was a good shot. God helped him. The jawbone of a donkey was what Samson used. And five loaves and two fish was what a little boy brought. And he put it down. He laid it down. And God multiplied it and fed 5,000 men, plus all the women and children, and had 10 baskets full at the end. God can do amazing things when we're willing to lay down what he's given us. So I'm encouraging you. I don't know what you're going to get out of this message today, but I'm going to park here just for a second. He's given you something. Can I encourage you to throw it down? Put it in God's hands and let him see and let you see and let the world see what God can do with a simple talents and simple abilities that we sometimes discount when they're turned over for his glory. Well, Moses isn't done yet on his excuses. Number four, I'm not eloquent. <laughs> it's kind of funny that he says this because actually the Bible contradicts him. Because in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, when Paul is writing and speaking, he says this about Moses. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Don't you hate it when somebody corrects you when you've exaggerated and lied and they come back later and it's like, oh no, I got a dilemma here now. It's in the Bible. Moses says one thing. God says another thing to the, through uh, the Apostle Paul. Who's correct? Well, the Apostle Paul was correct. Moses had an agenda. He says, I'm not eloquent. It's the same excuse that Jeremiah gave God when he was appointed by God in Jeremiah chapter one, verses six through 10. Jeremiah said, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. And God said, don't talk like that. And God touched his mouth and he filled Jeremiah's mouth with words and he became one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. I can really relate to, to Moses and Jeremiah in a very minute way in the failure department because there are often times that I don't want to speak. In fact, one of the things that almost kept me out of ministry was a preaching class that I was in in seminary. And I became so overwhelmed and devastated uh, in this class that I, I couldn't even put a sermon together. And Becky can attest to this. I'd, I'd stay up at night just frantically crying out to God because I was so overwhelmed with the concept of speaking in behalf of God. I couldn't, I can't even begin to express to you. I went to my preaching professor and I said, I have to leave ministry. I can't, I'm going to quit school. It's, it's pointless. What's the point of me doing all this preparation? I don't have the ability to do this. I can't do it. And he prayed with me. And, uh, you know, here I am. And a lot of you you may think to yourself, you should have listened to your advice. 
But I also want to tell you that sometimes when I go just even a few weeks without speaking in the pulpit, I get nervous coming back. I, I, I don't think I've ever shared that with any of you before. Uh, not many of you know that. I don't even know if I've, I think my wife knows that. But oftentimes when I come up after kind of getting out of the groove of doing the sermon prep and doing it every week, I come back after two or three weeks and it's just like, God, help me, help me. I'm not eloquent. I can't do it. You know, uh, I was sharing with the, with the uh, fellowship last night as we were having our service that, that I go through my sermon once before I teach it. I'm preparing all week, but I only practice it once and I do just kind of a dry run and I, I can't tell you how bad I am. I can't tell you how, how many times I stumble over my words and how I can't find the right word and I just give up. I give up right in the middle of my preparation. I go on to the next point because I just can't do it. And what I want to tell you is that when I get up here, I'm totally trusting God to help me speak. And the only way I can give any kind of a meaningful delivery is because God's helping me. And so I come up here in fear and trembling every week, not afraid of speaking, not afraid of the, the process, but knowing that unless God shows up, it's going to be a dud. And I won't have anything to offer. And all you people have will have come and been disappointed. Not in me, but you, you want to hear from God. And I want you to hear from God. And I hear from God when God is working and speaking. I want that. But I feel so weak and inadequate every week. And I know I am. And that's why so often I pray in my prayer, Holy Spirit, please help me. And I'm sincere because I know what I was. I know I almost quit ministry because of this aspect of public speaking and of preaching and teaching. And I know what it feels like when I've been out of the pulpit for just a few weeks, how difficult it is to come back. And so here's Moses out of the pulpit, so to speak, for 40 years, talking about Rusty. And no offense to anybody here named Rusty, but talking about feeling out of sorts. But this is where Moses is. And my heart goes out to the guy because I can totally relate. And just on a small scale of how inept you feel and how inadequate you feel to try to deliver something so important as the word of God. But I like uh, what Paul did, who was one of the great orators of the Bible. As he said, I didn't come with eloquence or superior speech. In fact, he said, my preaching was not with wise or persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power. And that's all a man or a woman or anyone can ever offer to God is, God, it's got to be you. Otherwise, it's not going to be much. And so Moses recognized that, but still he's throwing up smokescreen excuses. God's answer, supernatural assistance. God said, I can do it. I'll fill you. I'll give you the words. I'll give you the ability to speak. And Moses really had it wrong because all of his sentences began with, I am not. And God's statement was, but I am that should answer every doubt we've got in life. I'm not this. I'm not that. I can't do that. And God says, I am. Not angry. Nice. But I am. Whatever we're not, God is. Whatever he calls us to, he'll make us sufficient for. And so, yes, of course we're weak. I, it's the most free thing to just be honest about who we really are and to remove all the pretense and just say, you know what? We need God for everything. But Moses begins his sentence with, I'm not eloquent. I'm not capable. I'm not smart enough. I don't know God enough. The people won't listen to me. He's got one excuse after another. But God says, I will help you speak. I will teach you what to say. God is sufficient to enable us for the calling that he has on our life. If he can make a donkey speak, I think he can probably work with us. If he can make the mute and the dumb speak, I think he can work with us. And if he can make men and women speak in foreign languages that they aren't familiar with, as he did on the day of Pentecost, then I think he can work with us. Well, verse 13, the fifth objection of Moses, he says, he's really now, all the phony baloney is over. And he says, Lord, the truth is, please. And I like how he says it, please, Lord, send someone else to do it. This is the, now we're at the root of the problem. He doesn't want to, the job. He doesn't want the assignment. He simply tells God, I'm not up for this. I'm not interested. I'm not willing. I don't want it. What I find interesting in this, um, uh, just a phrase that I want to talk about for a minute in verse 13 is he says, Lord, send someone else. You see a problem with that? Anybody know what Lord means? It means sovereign king. 
It means the ruler of my life. It means the one that calls the shots, the creator of the universe. It's the one that determines our steps from beginning to the very end of our life. It's the one that knows the beginning from the end, who is the beginning from the end. It's the one that when we fully comprehend not just him as Savior, but as Lord, that we have no option except to bow the knee, prostrate ourselves before him and say, Lord, your will be done, not mine. That's what that word Lord means. But Moses says, oh Lord, phony, please send someone else. I am convicted again. Am I the only one in the room that's done this before? Oh Lord, whatever your will is, and I got an agenda. You know, I already know what the outcome is going to be because I want a certain outcome, right? And oh Lord, your will be done as long as it's kind of in keeping with what I want to do. But God, I really want your will. I'm seeking you. And God tells you what to do in the Bible. Your friends are telling you what to do. Lord, that's not quite what I wanted to hear. Lord, anything for your glory, anything for your name. Holy Spirit, please tell me what I want to hear. Please, I want what I want. Oh no, I'm sorry, Lord. I mean what you want. And we have this battle in our hearts about the obedience to the Lordship of Christ. And so here we have Moses in this internal battle that's taking place in his life. But you can't call him Lord and then do what you want and reject his call on your life. I have another confession as a pastor and teacher that I'll share with you, that when I was an associate pastor with Bill Stonebreaker in, in Honolulu, some it's a long time ago, uh, he would ask me occasionally when he'd be gone or out of town or busy or whatever, would you like to speak? And I'm like, I would try to be sophisticated in my answer. You know what? I, I'd feel like maybe is there another guy. I'm thinking maybe this person. I'd give him a suggestion on who I thought would be a good replacement for Pastor Bill. And he'd say, you know what? You're right. He would do a good job. And inside I'd be going, <laughs> you know, but I'd be real cool with him, you know. And then he'd ask me again, and I'd say, you know what, I've got some appointments this week. Boy, I'm really busy. What about this guy? Or this guy did a good la job last time. And the truth was, is I just didn't want to do it. I'm just like Moses, came up with all kinds of phony excuses. But the bottom line, I didn't want to do it. Why? Because I was frightened. The truth is, I didn't want to get in front of the people and deliver a message. It's a lot of work. It's like, it's like doing a term paper every week, and then having to present it orally to everybody. And it's, it's just an enormous amount of work. And I just, the truth is, I didn't want to do it. And I took that same pattern with me to New York after I graduated from seminary. I took an associate pastor position. You know why? Because I didn't want to preach. That's the honest truth. When the nominating committee came and interviewed me, they, one of their first questions is, is, why aren't you taking a senior pastor position? We can't figure it out. You got all this experience. You've been trained, blah, 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 blah. Why, don't, why, aren't, why are you wanting to be number two at our church? And the truth is, is I wasn't being dishonest at the time, but now I realize that I was fooling myself, is that I told him, I said, because I just am a really good number two guy. I feel like that's where my giftings were. But the honest truth was, is that I was scared. I was afraid to get up in front of people. I'd been through all these things with seminary and everything else. I just felt like I couldn't do it. I felt so tangled and so frightened and so... Uh, incapable of representing God. It's one thing to get up and give a, a speech about the benefits of one type of peanut butter over another type of peanut butter in a speech class. It's a whole different thing to, to represent God Almighty and be an ambassador and speak and teach in his name. And the truth was, is I was just cowardly. When God finally began to speak to me about being a senior pastor, my, my, my heart was, I don't want to do it. The truth was, is I, I was just, just like Moses, please send someone else. Please send someone else, anybody else. There's got to be somebody more qualified. Send someone else. You know, the other truth I'll share with you, and I shared this last night, is that there's a benefit to being uh, second down the food chain because when you're first in the food chain, you take a lot of shots and you've got to take a lot of heat. And anybody in any kind of a leadership role in life, you know what it's like. Even being in the leader in your home or, or leading your kids or whatever, it's like you, you just get, you, you take the shots. You, and it was so nice, honestly, it was so nice to give counsel and advice to the senior pastor and then get out of the way when the bombs started dropping. You know, that's the honest truth. And Moses doesn't want bombs dropping on his head again. He's already got a bomb that dropped on his head. The last 40 years, he's been meditating on his failure in the desert. And so he didn't want to go there again. Well, it's interesting. All these excuses that God gives, and God put up with all of it until this last one. Because in essence, Moses was saying, I don't want the job. I want to encourage you that there are some things in our lives that we don't want either. God gives us a calling in our life. He gives us a calling as 
as a believer in Christ. And there are parts of that we say we don't want that. We pick and choose parts of the Bible and say, oh, I love God here, but I don't love God there. I'm not doing that. Sometimes in our own marriages, we say, you know what? The Bible says don't divorce. The Bible says be a spouse, a loving, kind spouse. Men have their role, women have their role. And we say, well, we don't really, that's too hard. I'm not going to do that. We have kids that we want to strangle their necks and farm them out and send them to Illinois or wherever. They, you could drop the kids off. Anybody read about that? You can drop your kids off up until they're like 18 and the state will take care of them. Everybody started dropping their kids off over there. You know, People were crossing county lines and going flying from the, all parts of the world to get, drop their kids off. You know, and, and it's because it's hard. There are times that it's hard. And we don't want that job sometimes. Sometimes the work that you've got, the place that you are, the neighbors you have, the friends that you've got, the things you've gone through, the crises physically and financially, and you're saying to God, I don't want this job anymore. And all I can tell you is that I can relate. And Moses can relate. But the one thing I also want to warn you with on the flip side of that comment is, is that God got angry with Moses. You know, I've had people angry with me I've had friends angry with me. My wife, I know it's unbelievable, but she's even been angry with me. But the one person I'd never want angry with me is God. But Moses infuriated God. And so God says, Moses, Aaron will be your mouth, and you will be to him as God. It's interesting that Moses was vying for someone else and he wanted someone else and and again even as a pastor there are parts of me at times and I've shared this with Bruce and and Scott and Josh there are times that I kind of honestly I want them to shoulder everything with me along with I want them to it's not that I want them to experience what I go through sometimes but I kind of want some camaraderie sometimes and sometimes my desire for camaraderie has caused me to want to share with them and kind of bring them into my pain and I can't do that I have to deal with that with God they can be my friends but there's a line in the sand of what's appropriate for me to talk to them about or share. I've got to be the one to take this. But sometimes there's, a, there's truth when you're, when you're leading something and, and it's either going well or not well or whatever in between. Sometimes you want people to kind of, you know, say, I'm with you, man. I'm with you all the way. And that's what Moses wanted. He wanted somebody that would be with him. At the very least, be with him. Well, sometimes, you know, you got to be really careful what you ask for because this Aaron, this brother of his, brought some benefit, but also some curse because he's the one that instigated the worship of the golden calf. It was uh, Aaron's sons who blasphemed God with their impure offerings and brought judgment on the people of Israel in the desert. It was Aaron who openly, along with his sister Miriam, led a mutiny against Moses' leadership. So it's, it's true. Uh, you know, better two than, than one. The Bible talks about that in Ecclesiastes because if one falls down, another can help him up. But pity the man who falls down and has no one to help him up. And I want to follow it up by pity the man that has someone that's there with him that pushes him down and kicks him in the rear end when he goes down. And that's essentially what, what Moses ended up with in his brother. Some good and some bad. But he was ready to go on the mission now that he had Aaron and the help and finally came to the conclusion that he wasn't going to get out of this assignment. So he went to his father-in-law Jethro and got his consent. Now, I like that about Moses. Now, he's asking permission of his father-in-law to move. Okay, well, that, that's maybe not bad if you're like 21 or 22, but Moses is 80. He's 80 years old. He's an old man. No offense to anybody that's 80 here, but he's older. I got to really rephrase things now. I got to dig out. Okay, he's a mature man. He's a wise man just beginning to reach his peak of value in society because of his knowledge and depth of insight about all things pertinent to life. That was God that helped me dig out of that one. <laughs> but here's this old guy. And he goes and he asks his father-in-law for permission. I don't want to park on this too long except to say, you know, there's a place for submission in our lives that's really being modeled by Moses here. And, you know, we're, we're all anxious to get out from under submission to people. So we can't wait to leave the house. We can't wait to, you know, have our own family and to call the shots and be the boss and be in charge and all that. But there's a really beautiful thing about submission that, that Moses models for us. It's not a, 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 a significant point in the text, but the Holy Spirit captured my heart with it. Because when we're submitted to God, we find submission to the other authorities that God puts in our life so much easier 
But Moses hadn't been in submission to God until this point. But once he submitted to God, then he finds himself in submission to people that maybe the Bible doesn't even require him to be in submission to. And yet he submits himself anyway and honors and respects those that are in leadership in his life. And I want to encourage you to live the same way. If you're having trouble with submission to your spouse, to your husband, to a worker, to uh, your employer, uh, to your government or anything else, you probably are having a trouble with your own submission to God. But if you don't have a problem with your submission to the Lord, the rest of them kind of fall like dominoes. It's so much easier if you have a confidence in God. Well, the Bible tells us that uh, in verse 21 and 23 that that Moses received this prophetic word about Pharaoh, that all these guys were dead. Uh, God told him that Pharaoh would harden his heart. This new king that had arisen up would would have a hard heart and that, uh, that he would not let the people go. And I want to take just a minute to talk about this because this is a, there are actually three passages in here that are confusing in this text, and I'm going to address two of them. I want to concentrate on these last two uh, for time's sake. Is this hardening of Pharaoh's heart because he says that God says, I'm going to harden his heart. Which for a lot of people, they throw up the flag and say, that's unfair. This is one of the reasons why I can't believe God, why I can't trust him. He's unkind, he's cruel, he's a dictator, and it's going to get worse because we're going to talk about God trying to kill Moses in in a minute or two. But why would God harden someone's heart? Well, the interesting thing is, is that in the Bible, in this passage in Exodus, uh, beginning in chapter 4 that we're in, and then going through chapter 14, uh, 10 times the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Also interesting is that 10 times in the Bible, beginning in Exodus 7.13 and through 13.15, the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. The truth is, is that both statements are true and don't contradict each other. God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart in no way makes God responsible for Pharaoh's sin. There's a quote I came across that kind of helped me. I hope it helps you in this regard. Remember that the same sun that melts wax also hardens clay. A lot of it has to do with the content and consistency of our own hearts. But the truth is, is that when you go to Romans chapter 9, The Bible's very clear is that God says, I can harden who I want to harden and I can soften who I want to soften. So there's really no getting around the fact that God has the authority and the sovereignty to do it. Then the question becomes, is he fair? Well, I think the reason that we struggle with the fairness of God is because our beginning point, our presupposition is in error. Our presupposition is that we're nice people, we're good people, uh, we all deserve a fair shake at life, everyone deserves to go to heaven. That's our premise that's in error. The correct statement is is that we are all damned, we've all sinned, we are all a part of our ancestry of of, uh, Adam and Eve and their sin, and we have evidenced that ancestry in our own sinful lives. And the Bible says that one sin in Adam and Eve's life was enough to condemn them and to shove them out and to be rejected and ejected from the presence of God until redemption would come. And that redemption, of course, was ultimately in Christ. So we, we're starting with the wrong premise if we, if we think we're all on an even playing field, we're all good folk and all that. That's not what the Bible teaches. Now that may offend you, but that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that we are all destined for hell. That's why I get up every day and I think to myself, if I have a hard day in particular that I'm facing, it's like, I should be burning in hell. And suddenly I just get all cheery because whatever I'm dealing with in life is a lot better than that. And I, I recommend it to you highly. Just get up in the morning if you're having a bad day and just remind yourself you should be burning in hell. So if like President Bush or any of the other presidents that have preceded him and the presidents that will follow him at the end of his tenure decide to give clemency or to pardon someone, that doesn't mean that the rest in prison aren't guilty and deserve the punishment. It just means that that president has made a determination for whatever reason to grant clemency or pardon to a single individual who may or may not be guilty probably is guilty, but extenuating circumstances, whatever. But it's up to him. He has the authority in the closing days of his office to pardon. God has the authority to pardon. And our heart should not be, God's not fair. Oh, God is so fair. God is so gracious. We all should be in hell. But we're not. And we're not going there if we believed in Christ and trusted in salvation through him alone. What a gift God has given us. What a kind God What a loving God to reach down in the midst of our rebellion and rejection and sin and excuses and express to us his kindness in Christ 
on the cross. My concern more, to be honest with you, is not the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, but I'm more concerned about the hardening of my own. And that's why in the book of Hebrews chapter four, it says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So I would encourage you, don't be so worried about what God is doing or not doing with someone else. My question is, is your heart like wax before the sun or is it like clay? That's my question for me. And we have to keep allowing God to soften our heart by his spirit so that we can be agreeable and malleable in the hands of God. Well, the Bible tells us that God told him as a result of Pharaoh's rejection of this message and the unwillingness of Pharaoh to address Israel as God's son and treat God's son with kindness, that God would take the life of Pharaoh's firstborn son. Which brings us to verse 24, which is a, a fascinating, confusing, bizarre story. And I'll grant you all that, but I, I, I'm hoping and praying by the time we go through this, it's going to become very, very clear to you. And, uh, and you'll have an answer to this very perplexing text. The Bible tells us that Moses and Zipporah and their two sons, in obedience to the command of God, are on their way to Egypt to carry out God's purposes. But on the way, the Lord determines to kill Moses. I don't know. Uh, again, it's bad enough that God is angry with you, but he's putting the hit on you, and he's the, he's the hit man. That is totally scary. Where do you run from God? He's everywhere. You can't escape him. He can hit you with diseases. He can turn your hand to leprosy. He can give snakes. He can pop them up out of rocks. He can do anything he wants. You're just completely history when you're on the hit list and he's the hit man. And so Moses, he's going, uh, if you keep this in context, he's being brought by God unwillingly in many ways, but finally going. And he's going for what purpose? He's going to confront Pharaoh with his sin. He's going to confront Egypt with their evil of putting into bondage the people of Israel, God's son. He is going to bring judgment in God's name to the people of Egypt. But the Bible says from this context that he himself was in rebellion against God in a, the most fundamental, basic aspect of being a follower of God at that time in the Old Testament, and it had to do with circumcision. His first son, Gershom, had been circumcised years earlier. Gershom is now about 40 years old, which makes Eliezer, who's the second son of, of Zipporah and Moses, probably a teenager or maybe in his 20s. And for some reason that the Bible doesn't clarify for us, Moses had not circumcised his son. When was it prescribed in the Bible? On the eighth day after birth. The Bible tells us in Genesis 17, this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. I don't want to, I want to be a little careful here, but the covenant of circumcision in the Old Testament was for us like the gospel in the New Testament. If you don't have the covenant of circumcision, you're not a part of the kingdom of God, part of the family of God. Now, even in the Old Testament, it was by faith alone, so I don't want to confuse things here, but it was such a fundamental part of being in the family of God that if you weren't circumcised, you weren't a part of the family of God. Why in the world would Moses disobey God in such a fundamental principle of covenant relationship with his people and with God? Well, I've got some guesses, and these are purely speculative, so keep that in mind. It could be that Moses just was busy. I, I, this is really a hard one for me. I can't grab that one. But he just put it off and put it off and put it off. And pretty soon his, his eight-day-old baby is 22. And he's like, I don't really want to circumcise my son now. You know, I mean, that's a little uncomfortable. That's a little weird. You know, I'm not going there. And he just put it off and put it off and put it off. Possible. More likely is that his wife, Zipporah, who was not an Israelite, but a Midianite who wasn't accustomed to what she may have considered a barbaric practice. And to institute this barbaric practice, they did this with Gershom, and she was probably there, and she's like, no, oh, it's my baby. Uh, some of you have sons. And uh, at some point, you had to make a decision because the doctor came in and says, would you like to circumcise your son? They don't wait eight days. It's like, you know, an hour and a half after the baby's born or less. And it's like, 
you know, they never brought that up in premarital counseling that you're going to be facing that decision when you have a baby boy, you know? And so suddenly you're in the room with your husband and say, what do we do? Should we circumcise him? Shouldn't we? It's like, well, you're circumcised. I don't know. Should we as your family? I mean, he's going to feel weird. I mean, we go through all of these machinations trying to figure out, should we, is there a reason for it? We look at online, medical reasons for circumcision. Oh uh, yeah, there's some benefits, but they're, oh, that's not good. And, oh, that's, oh, that's, well, that's not good. And we go through all these things about circumcision. Here's my guess is that Zipporah, after witnessing the circumcision of her son, and that takes weeks to recover from, but my guess is that, is that Zipporah just said, you know, I, I can't do it. Moses, can we wait? Just wait. I'm not comfortable with this. This is ugly. I don't see why this is necessary. You're a servant of God. You don't have to prove it by some symbol like this. You know, Moses, just let's wait. I, I can't do it. I just can't see Eliezer going through what, you know, Gershom, you know how he got an infection and everything and it took longer than, you know, I mean, at least things go on, you know, and, and I, I'm thinking that maybe is what happened. And so to, to accommodate his wife, this circumcision didn't take place. And so now Moses is about to go bring judgment on someone else when he himself is not right with God in the most fundamental aspect of covenant relationship that God had instituted in the Old Testament. Do you understand what's happening here? Interesting. Zipporah, if she was the one that kind of required her husband to have an accommodation for her, she is the one that corrected the problem. Don't you find that interesting? It wasn't Moses, it was Zipporah. Right away, she went and got a flint knife and circumcised Eliezer. And then through the, the product of the circumcision, at her husband's feet, which was a symbol of atonement for Moses, a blood sacrifice. I find it interesting that Zipporah right away knew what was wrong. Don't you find that interesting? It doesn't say that she had a revelation from God and said, Zipporah, it's because of you. You know, it's, the, it's lack. I think, I think Zipporah knew right away because she knew the covenant and she knew that this concept of cutting off of the people who weren't circumcised, she understood it. So right away she knew. Have you ever done that where it's like some bad things start happening in your life and you're going, uh-oh, I know why. I think I might know why. And you're convicted because you already have some, some ideas of guilt in your own heart of things that you've put off and not taken care of. And can I, can I give you a little su suggestion? Unless you want to be on God's hit list in some manner, the good thing is just to take care of it before the crisis happens. God doesn't want you in crisis. The gentleness of his Holy Spirit should be enough but he does have the ability to speak louder and to take action when necessary. But she uh, was willing to do this. And the significance of this, of course, again, as I'm saying it, is that Moses couldn't, in good conscience, challenge other people to step out in obedience to God when he was in violation of a clear command of Scripture. It's a real simple principle. Here's the principle even reduced to a more practical level. Don't try to lead other people if you're not walking with God. Don't try to tell your kids how to live their life if you're not doing the same things. If you want your kids to be godly, are you godly? If you want your wife to, to respond in a godly way, are you responding in a godly way? If you want people in church to respond in an appropriate way, are you leading the way? Are you honoring God in these things? In other words, we need to be examples in all these things. And Moses wasn't an example. He was about to represent God Almighty as an ambassador for the King of Kings to the, to the King of of a nation, and he wasn't right with God. That's a very dangerous thing to do. And that's why James says, let, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that we shall incur a stricter, stricter judgment. You know that the Bible also says in, um, in 1 Peter, and I can't find it in my notes right now, but it says that judgment will begin with the house of the Lord. It begins with us. God wants to purify the church. How does he do that? Well, he does it through our own uh, responsibility of, of church discipline, which is not easy to do. It's painful. He also does it through our counseling of each other. He does it through people in our family that say, you know what, I don't think that's the right thing. He does it through the word of God when he speaks to us by his word and convicts us of something. And he says, please go in the right way. Let your heart be like wax, not like clay. Let the sun and the power and the, the radiance of my purposes shine in your life. That's God's intent. But because Moses was not himself right with God, God would not allow him to represent him before the ungodly. What's my purpose in saying all these things? Well, simply to clarify the text and give you an, an understanding of the purpose and how it fits in. Moses is going to confront Pharaoh. Moses is in sin. 
God confronts Moses on that sin. By God's grace, his life is spared and he corrects what was wrong and now is still on his way to Egypt. I want to encourage you, we need every hand on deck in this church. We need every man and every woman carrying out the purposes of God. The answer isn't to not go on the mission and say, I'm disqualified. The answer is to get right with God. Just get right with God and then continue on the mission. I need, we need, God wants every hand on deck. Please, for the sake of the kingdom and the sake of people that don't know Christ, please, get right with God. I'm not saying you're not. I'm talking to people out there somewhere. I don't know where they are, but they're out there somewhere that need to know that message. And maybe for us in a small way, we need to turn our life over to God. The outcome of these things is that the Lord left them alone and they, they made their journey. And in chapter five, we're gonna see the beginning of that remarkable effort. But I have just a couple more things. Moses and Aaron meet in the desert. If you'll notice... God had already spoken to Aaron and God had already called Aaron and God had already sent Aaron to meet Moses at Sinai before Moses asked that someone else would be sent. Isn't that amazing? Just the power of God. He's working in your life. Before you even know what you need, he knows. Before you're even aware of a problem, he has spoken before the solution is even on your mind, he has already sent the answer. He's a good God. And so Aaron is on his way. They haven't seen each other in 40 years. God sovereignly, divinely guides him to the right place. And they meet and they discuss all these things. And the people responded favorably, the Bible says, and they bowed down and worshiped. All of Moses' fears all his concerns were exaggerations and overamplifications of his overactive mind. God fulfilled. I want to just close with wrapping this up with several applications. Number one is that God's got a calling on our lives. And my question to you is, what is your answer? Is it send me or is it send someone else? Some of you may not know Christ as your Savior and all this is new and you want to know God, you'd like to have a relationship with God, I can tell you it's very simple. It's just make pono. It means to acknowledge your sin. Admit to God what you've done wrong. That's not a bad practice for Christians to do as well when we've done the wrong thing. I encourage every man and woman here to make right with God today so that you can leave this place being reconciled with God. For those of you that don't know Christ, believing on Christ as your Savior, as your atonement, as the one that was cut off from this life for your sake, so that you could be forgiven of your sins, it's available to you. For the rest of us, it's an issue of being an ambassador for Christ. He wants to send you. Not only does he want to, he's already commanded that you go in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. So your answer has either been, Lord, I'm so stoked to go in your name. I don't even know what it all means, but I know that you're sufficient and you'll enable me. Or your answer has been either by default or by direct confrontation with God is saying, send someone else. The second thing that I'd like to just encourage you with that we've just talked about here briefly is don't, don't hold on to some private sin that's disqualifying you from effective ministry. Don't do it. The third thing is, is that whatever's in your hand, be willing to give it to God. And I'll take it a step further based on Romans 12.1. God's not just interested in what's in your hand. He's interested in you. And he says, in view of all these things, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And so God gives us an opportunity today. You can lay your life down again. You can surrender it. God's calling. Can you hear him? And he's saying, would you lay your life down? And you think, my simple life, what can my life possibly do? And all I can tell you is that that was the same thought Moses had. But his staff, as simple and as plain, functional as it was, opened a rock that quenched the thirst of millions, parted the Red Sea, and won great victories and enormous battles for the kingdom of God and for his glory. And our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he loves Father, we thank you for this word. 
and for your word. And Lord, I personally want to thank you for your help and Holy Spirit for your help in delivering this message. I pray that you would enliven it to us and cause our hearts to be soft and teachable and for us to act on what we've heard. The noble and good heart, that good soil that Jesus spoke of in the parable of the sower is the one that hears the word, retains it, retains it, and by persevering produces a good crop. May you see that in our lives, Lord, as we live for the King and as we serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Epic Life is a listener-supported ministry designed to encourage and equip believers to go big for God by loving Him, loving others, and making disciples. You can visit our website at theepiclife.org. God bless you.